You've never been here before. I was on my way home from work, like every day. Nothing was out of the ordinary until I reached my apartment building. The first sign was glued to the main entrance. You've never been here before. Weird, I mumbled to myself as I opened the door and made my way to the elevator. Inside, another note was glued next to the buttons. All floors will feel right. None of them are. I wondered if this was some kind of art project by one of the other people who lived in the building, or a prank. Some teens were playing. I pressed the button on the seventh floor, and the elevator started moving with a soft hum. The door opened, and right as I stepped outside, I saw another note stuck to the floor right in front of my shoes. It's not too late. Yet. I walked past it with a queasy feeling settling in my stomach. The building I live in has 20 floors in total, and I wondered if there was a note on each floor or whether mine was chosen for a particular reason. But I was tired from work and hungry because I only had a light lunch, and I was in no mood to deal with any of it. I tried to ignore it until I stepped inside my apartment, where another note was waiting for me. A small piece of paper in the same handwriting as all the others that I crossed on my way. This is not your home. It was glued to my wall, right across from the door. I stood in the middle of the room, my body suddenly frozen and my mind going blank. Then, finally, fear came over me. Somebody had been inside my apartment, or maybe they were still inside. I live in a one-bedroom apartment, so luckily there weren't many hiding spots. Collecting all my courage, I went to the bathroom and checked my closet and the space under my bed. All the places where a person could be hiding, but it appeared I was alone. So I locked my door and shut the bolt from the inside. When I finally felt safe enough, my thoughts started racing and a strange feeling settled inside of me. The feeling that these notes weren't a threat, but a warning. I decided to knock on my neighbor's door to ask whether they had found a similar note in their home. But before unlocking the door, I checked through my spy to see if there was anyone outside. I couldn't shake off the feeling that somebody could be waiting for me. At first, the part of the hallway that I could see was empty, but slowly, a shadow started appearing in my vision. The first thing I saw was a foot stepping closer to the front of my door. Slowly, the rest of the body followed. It belonged to a man dressed in an awkwardly fitting gray suit with wrinkles. His dark hair was parted in the middle. I tried to remember if I'd seen him before, but I couldn't say for sure. A lot of people lived in this building, but I hadn't met many of them. At first, I thought he was just passing through, and I tried to control my breathing, fearing that he could hear me through the door. But then he turned towards me as if he could see me from the other side. His gaze was fixed on mine, even though that was impossible, and then he slowly waved, Instinctively, I stumbled back. There was a loud knock, but I didn't move. I held my breath, even when I started feeling dizzy. I stood there for a few moments until I finally decided to check if he was still there. I imagined his face glued to the spy as I moved closer, but when I looked out again, he was gone. I couldn't make sense of the strange situation, but I knew that I needed to call for help. After all, there had been an intruder in my home, but when I went through my pockets and my bag, I realized that I didn't have my phone, and I never bothered to get a landline. It was too coincidental that I would lose my phone on such a strange day. Somebody must have stolen it from me. I knew I had to get out and talk to someone, but I was too afraid that I would stumble into the strange man in the hallway. Before I could think of another plan, the sound of a rapid knock came from my door, this time, it wasn't as loud. There was a different undertone to it. Fear. Carefully, I walked up to the spy again and saw the face of a young woman who lived on my floor. We'd met a few times in the hallway or the elevator. The knocking became slightly louder, and I heard a whisper. Please, let me in. Reluctantly, I opened my door. She slightly pushed me to the side as she made her way in quickly shutting the door behind her. 
Her eyes were wide, and her breathing was fast. What is going on? She cried out. Then her gaze went to the note on my wall. Did you get one too? I asked. I've been hiding in my apartment all day. Something scary is happening, she responded. I didn't know what to do, but then I finally heard your door. You're the first one I saw coming home. She looked away from the note and met my gaze. Then I saw that man outside. I waited till he was really gone and then I came over. Somebody was clearly messing with us, and seeing the fear in her eyes made me realize that this situation was real, and we needed to get away as soon as possible. I don't know what the hell is going on, but we should probably try to get outside. We can take some knives. We can't, she interrupted me. There's no way out. What do you mean, there's no way out? Once you're inside, you're stuck. What? She sighed. Do you know who I am? I'd met her a few times before, in the hallway or in the elevator where we'd chat a little. I don't remember your name, to be honest, but let me make this quick. You don't know me. We've never met before. I laughed, but before I could say anything, she continued. Think about it. Really think. Try to remember. Is this your home? I looked around the sparsely furnished room. I looked for photos or mail, but there was nothing. Then I looked at her again. She wasn't much younger than me. Early twenties, maybe. Her brown hair was long and curly. Going over her shoulders, I tried to think of the few times we met, and then I realized that something was off about the memories. Normally, when you remember moments, you see yourself from a third perspective but everything I remembered was from the first, like moments happening in real time. I swallowed. What is happening? Did I lose my mind? I finally asked, not really answering her questions. She shrugged. I tried to remember my family, friends, and my childhood, but there was nothing. What's your name? She asked. Dan, I think. I'm Cassie. Cassie, why did you come here? Why would you trust me if you don't know me? She shrugged again. I couldn't hide forever. Shouldn't I be trusting you? I shook my head. No, I'm not. I wasn't really sure what to say. I'm not dangerous. She smiled. I'm going out, I decided. Like you said, we can't hide forever. You look weak. I think you should eat something, collect your strength, and then we will form a plan. She was right, but I was suddenly feeling too sick to think clearly. I grabbed a big kitchen knife and made my way to the hallway. There was no one else around, so I quickly walked to the elevator. On my way, I noticed that the note I'd seen earlier was gone. I pressed the button on the elevator, but nothing happened. After a moment, I decided to check out the stairs but the door was locked. Suddenly, there was a noise. The elevator door opened and I made my way toward it, passing Cassie, who still stood in my doorway. I stopped when I noticed that somebody was inside the elevator, the man in the suit. Our eyes met briefly, and then he noticed the knife in my hand. He shook his head, but didn't say anything. Then he looked behind me, straight at Cassie. Come back, quick, she shouted. The man took a step forward, but before he got too close, I ran back to my apartment. Cassie shut the door and locked it. I was panting. I told you there's no way out, she whispered, turning towards my sofa. Well, not really mine, and sat down. We can't stay here forever. We'll starve, or he'll find a way in. He could break the door. We should try to make a sign. Hold it out the window, and maybe somebody will see it. Cassie frowned. The man started banging on the door from the outside again. Louder and louder. Get out of there. I heard the muffled voice of the man. It's not too late. His voice broke off. My eyes moved from her to the door. I wanted to scream and jump out the window, but it was too high, and I wouldn't make it. 
Cassie caught my eye. You could jump. Try it. What? You told me you weren't dangerous, but you didn't even bother to ask if I was. She crossed her legs on the sofa, and all the fear I had noticed on her face earlier was gone. She looked like a happy child, and I realized I had made a big mistake. She told me that I didn't really know her. The reason I trusted her in the first place was because I thought she was my neighbor, and then because I thought she was in danger, just like me. The banging on the door was back. Did you leave all those notes? I asked. She shook her head. Why would I warn you? Who is that man? Are you helping him? She chuckled. I inspected her face again. Something about it was off. It was too perfect. I grabbed the knife that I was still holding tight in my hand. Then there was a loud thud. The door had broken. I felt an arm grab me and pull me into the hallway. Before I could defend myself, I was being pulled into the elevator. I fell to the floor and saw Cassie in the hallway, smiling at me. But she didn't move closer and didn't try to stop him. Don't be gone too long, she said before the door closed. I remembered that I was still holding the knife and used all my strength to push it into the leg of the man. His eyes opened wide as he crumbled to the ground next to me. I pulled out the knife, ready to hit again, when he whispered, Please don't. I'm trying to help you. My entire body was shaking with rage, but when I saw the pained look on his face and the blood spilling on the floor, I stopped for a moment. She lured me in, just like you. Just like the others that are hiding, he croaked. Once she makes you eat something, you can't leave anymore, but she can't make you stay with force. I was lost for words. The door opened as we reached the first floor. Run, he told me. Try not to think of this place again. I looked at his bleeding leg and felt horrible. He was trying to help me this entire time. When he saw that I was hesitating, he added, my leg will be fine. We heal faster here. What's your name? I asked. Mateo. Gerard. It's the only thing I remember. Mateo, I can't just leave you. You have to as long as you still can. And be careful. She will find a way to get you back. The first moments after leaving the building were a blur. But as I got further away, my real memories came back of my real home and my past. The memories of Cassie and my imagined home stayed as well. However, when I tried to find the building again later, I couldn't. I researched online for hours until I finally found him. Matteo Gerard disappeared five years ago on his way to a job interview. He was only 20 then. As I looked further into it, I found that he had disappeared once before after he went to a festival. He was gone for a week when he suddenly came back to his parents out of nowhere. I can only imagine what happened then. They probably thought he'd taken too many drugs or that he was going through a psychotic episode. So a year later, Cassie found him again, and this time, he couldn't save himself. He told me not to think about it, but I can't stop it. I wonder why she let me go so easily. She was able to control my mind and my memories. There was no way she couldn't stop me. But then I think of the smirk on her face when she told me to just jump. She let me leave because she knew she could get me back and play another round. Ouch, honey. I feel like I have a swollen button at the top of my neck. Can you please look, asked Emma, my girlfriend. I stood behind her as she lifted her hair looking at me with a worried expression in the bathroom mirror. She did indeed have a swollen pimple just at the top of her neck. It seemed to be gorged with blood. Yes, it's just a swollen pimple. Don't touch it too much and it'll go away in a few days, I said to reassure her. She frowned and started scratching it with her other hand. Hey, what did I say? But it itches like hell. You can't imagine. It's just a matter of a few days. Come on. Finish removing your makeup and come to bed, I said, kissing her on the cheek. After about ten minutes, 
she finally came to bed with me. But during the night, I felt her going back and forth to the bathroom, which was directly accessible through a door in our bedroom. The next morning, I woke up alone in bed. I went into the bathroom, still misty-eyed, and saw Emma with dark circles under her eyes, rubbing the back of her neck. Have you been here all night? I asked. She gasped. You scared me. What? Is it morning already? We both sat down in the dining room with our breakfasts, and I saw her scratching the back of her neck again. It can't be a classic pimple if it itches this much. Let me look again, I said as I stood up. She lifted the hair behind her neck. The pimple had tripled in size. It was red and warm to the touch. It had definitely become infected since I could feel that it was not hard but soft, as if filled with us. Emma, in my opinion, you've got ingrown hair or something. You need to go and see a doctor first thing this morning. You can't stay like this. I saw her tired eyes shift toward me. No. Wait. I've still got to work on a project at work I've been working on for months. I can't. You risk getting a hole in the back of your neck. Or worse, if you leave it like that. Make an appointment with the doctor this morning and tell him it's an emergency. I'll take you there by force if I have to. I looked again at the lump on the back of her neck and shivered. Okay, okay, I'll go. Don't worry, I'll call right away. Once I got to work, I anxiously waited for news of her doctor's appointment, which was scheduled for 11 a.m. With no news from her at 11, 30 a.m., I texted her to find out what the doctor had said. Oh, nothing. He just told me it was an inflamed fever blister and to just rub some ointment on it. Everything's fine. I was both pleased and suspicious. An inflamed fever blister. Not a chance. Either she was lying to me or the doctor who'd seen her was a quack. We used to text and send memes during our work days. It was part of our usual routine. But this afternoon, no matter how many times I texted and sent memes, she didn't respond. I was already having trouble pretending everything was fine, so the fact that she wasn't answering was stressing me out even more. I finally called her, but she was impossible to reach. At 5, 0 p.m., I finally couldn't wait any longer, and I left early to get home and find out why she hadn't been in touch. On the way, I imagined her laughing at me for rushing back when she was just having a nap on the sofa without her phone. But I'd rather look like a fool than wait. I parked my car and went inside. Honey? I asked aloud. No answer. I walked through the living room, the kitchen, and the bedroom. And finally, I saw a light in the bathroom. I gently pushed open the door, and there she was scratching not just the back of her neck, but her whole head with her nails, like a fury while staring at herself in the mirror. Honey? She cried out in surprise. It doesn't seem like you're feeling any better, I said shyly. She stared at me for several seconds and finally replied. It's like the itch has spread to the rest of my skull with a bewildered look. I used a technique I used myself for itching, which was to apply ice to the area. I also had a mosquito pimple that had swollen up behind my right knee, and I had placed an ice pack on it to numb it. As her head rested on me, I applied an ice pack to the base of her neck, and finally, she seemed to relax. Tomorrow, you're going back to a doctor. And a competent one this time, okay? She smiled at me and nodded weakly. That night, I put a fresh ice pack between her neck and her pillow, figuring it would get her through the night. I was startled awake by something tickling my nose. I rubbed my face and looked around. It was still dark outside the window. I was about to go back to sleep when I noticed that Emma wasn't lying next to me, and only the ice pack was left on her pillow. Emma, I asked, rising from the bed. My eyes were still tingling and the floor seemed to be moving under my feet. I saw a light under the bathroom door and took a few steps to reach it. I tried to open it, 
but it was locked. Emma, Emma, please open up. No answer. My heart began to pound, and adrenaline jolted me awake. Emma, if you don't open up in five seconds, I'll break the door down. I waited anxiously for five seconds, which seemed like an eternity. But there was no sound from the other side, only the light coming from under the door. I started banging my fist against the door. Maybe she spent part of the night scratching her head again and fell asleep from exhaustion. The harder I pounded, the more anxiety and adrenaline coursed through my veins. I shouldn't have left her like that. I should have taken her to the hospital last night. Why didn't I? I couldn't help imagining what was going on behind that door. And the more time passed, the more horrible things I imagined. Eventually, I started kicking the lock, ignoring the pain on my bare feet. The door finally gave way under my repeated assaults, and I rushed into the bathroom. And what I saw made my heart miss a beat. The floor was stained with blood, as was the shattered bathroom mirror. And opposite the mirror, sitting on the tiled floor and looking inert, was Emma. I approached her slowly, trying to avoid stepping on the blood, and noticed that tufts of hair were also scattered everywhere. Emma? Her arms and legs were stretched out along her body. Her face was pointing down, and her hair, or what was left of it, was blocking my view. Her skin was so pale. I crouched down in front of her, tears welling up in my eyes. The color of her skin, her motionless torso. She was dead, I was sure of it. I burst into tears, staring at her as best I could behind the tears. I had to make sure. I had to touch her and seek a pulse towards her neck, even though I knew it was hopeless. At that moment, I thought the worst thing that could happen was to feel nothing under my fingers. And yet, I was wrong. I delicately lifted her chin to touch her neck with my other hand and felt movement. My eyes widened in surprise. She had a pulse, but its rhythm seemed chaotic. And as I lifted her chin again to see her face, her head tilted back. And I watched in horror as dozens, then hundreds of tiny spiders emerged from her mouth, eyes, and ears. Her body seemed to tremble as if hundreds of them were still inside her, coming out to defend their nest. I screamed at the top of my lungs at this vision of horror, screaming again and again until my vocal cords broke. Tiny spiders reached my feet and I tried to crush them. But there were so many of them and there were still hundreds coming out of her. I ran away. I just grabbed my phone from the bedroom as I passed and ran outside, still in my boxers. Outside, I spent several minutes brushing off imaginary spiders from my body. It felt like they were all over me, inside me. After a while, I managed to calm down and call for help. A police car arrived, accompanied by an ambulance. They tried to question me, but I was in a catatonic state. After several hours at the police station, I was informed by a policeman that they considered Emma's death to be accidental, so they were going to release me. I was sitting in a chair, and the policeman kept talking in front of me, but at that moment, I was somewhere else. I kept seeing those tiny spiders coming out of Emma and spreading everywhere. And as I watched the scene repeat itself over and over in my head, I realized that for several minutes now, I hadn't been able to stop scratching the swollen spot that was right at the back of my right knee 